How many of you brought your Bible? Will you hold up the Bible all over the building tonight? And if you will, I'd like you to join me back on page number 658 in the Old Testament. 658. And uh, that's Psalms 119. And if you'll find your place there, I'd like to read a couple of verses here. And then we'll jump right into the message this evening. Psalms 119. Why don't you do this when you come to church Sunday, or maybe Saturday night. You know, you've seen people that hadn't been here that maybe I've missed. And then maybe I have saw folks that hadn't been here that you've missed. But maybe if you've missed some people here recently, hadn't seen them in a while, why don't you drop them a text if you got their phone, uh, got, got their phone number, and uh, maybe just encourage them to come back to church, tell them, man, it's safe in here, and, and uh, we're having fun, a good time, and uh, let's try to get some of these folks back in church. I was uh, encouraged by our crowd Sunday, 170. I think Brother Mark said we were somewhere around four. 54 something in our record. All together, we had over a thousand people here Sunday, which is a blessing. But uh, man, I'd like to get her back up there where she was. Amen. And, uh, and move and go forward. And uh, so, uh, if you will, reach out to people maybe you hadn't seen in a while. Let's do our best to get folks uh, back to church. Tell them, tell them everything's safe in here. And uh, tell them we ain't seen the first cootie in here. Uh, and so, uh, let's try our best to get them in church. Psalms 119 tonight, page 658. Look at verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, I've told you Psalms 119 is that great chapter in our Bible. It's the longest chapter by far in our Bible. But basically, this whole chapter is about the Word of God. And I think with the exception of three verses, every verse, and there's a hundred and what, 72 of these, I believe, or something like that in this chapter. There are 176 verses in this chapter, and all but three of them deal with the Word of God. Now, it's called by different names like the law or the statutes or testimonies, or sometimes it's called the Word. But this whole chapter is about the Word of God. And so, blessed, verse 1, are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law. There it is, the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His, here it is, testimonies, and, uh, that, and that seek Him with the whole heart. Now, I got to thinking about those two verses, and there is a recipe for happiness right there in those two verses of Scripture. First of all, if you really want to be happy, number one, you got to be saved. Look at verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Now, the only way to be undefiled is to be washed in the blood of Jesus that we've sung about around here tonight. That's the only way that you, you know, sin brings defilement. Sin makes us dirty. Sin corrupts us. Sin contaminates us. And yet, Yet to be undefiled, of course, there's a measure that we have to keep ourselves undefiled. But aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus that washes us and, and cleanses us from all of our sin? If you want to be happy, you've got to be saved. Number two, if you want to be happy, you've got to be saturated. Look again at verse number one. Uh, uh, Blessed are the undefiled. Wait, notice who walk in the law of of the Lord. You want to be happy? Hey, you can't be happy even as a Christian, even as a saved person, if you're trying to walk the way of the world. There's no such thing as a happy, worldly Christian. No such thing as that. And uh, the only way to be happy, even after getting saved, is to walk in the law of the Lord, to saturate yourself with the Bible. And then verse 2 tells us a way to be happy is to be steadfast. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Every day of our life, we ought to do our best. And I know none of us, none of us are perfect. But every day of our life, we ought to do our best to keep the testimonies of the Lord, to walk according to the Bible. So be saved, be saturated, be steadfast. But then the last part of verse 2 tells us if we want to be happy, we need to be seeking. What do we need to seek? Notice verse 2, that seek him with the whole heart. Now, buddy, I'm telling you, there's four steps to happiness as a child of God. And if we'll follow those steps, we too can be a happy, happy child of God. Well, we're currently in a series of messages that I've entitled, Bible Words That Every Child of God Should Know. And once again, just as the title suggests, this is a series of messages involving and emphasizing 
uh, various words that we find throughout the Bible. Words that we as God's people ought to be familiar with as we live out these last days. Now, of course, it's important for us as God's people to have a relationship with the Bible. I hope your Bible is not something that you just throw up on the shelf when you get home on Sunday and jerk back down on Wednesday nights. I hope your Bible is a daily, regular part of your life. If it's not, I want to tell you something. You're never going to be what God intended for you to be. I'll never be what God intended for me to be if I don't spend some time daily in the Word of God. I, I Like you, probably most of you, I have a set number of chapters that I read every day from my Bible. A set number, I just go through there and, and I read those chapters and, and, uh, and it's important for us to daily take in the Word of God. So what we're doing in these Wednesday nights is we're emphasizing words of the Bible. And to do so, we're using our English alphabet kind of as an outline. Now, of course, I know the Bible wasn't written in the English language. Uh, I appreciate the translators, King James. I appreciate getting the Bible, the Word of God, in our English language where we can understand the Bible. However, we know the Bible was written in Hebrew. It was written in Aramaic, a few chapters, and the New Testament was written in Greek. But for an outline, we've just been using our ABC alphabet to kind of work through the various words of the Bible. Now, last week, we were all the way down to the letter M. And we looked at some great words in our Bible that begin with the letter M. For instance, the word mediator. Boy, what a good word in our Bible. The word mercy. Aren't you glad God has mercy on us? Amen. The word mediator, the word mercy. Then we considered the word mark, not the person, but the mark. And we talked a little bit about the mark of the beast. And then we concluded last week with the, the word Messiah. Great Bible words that begin with the letter M. Now tonight we're on our 14th letter of our 26 letter alphabet. Boy, when we come to X and some of those, we're going to really struggle. But tonight we're all the way down to the letter N. Now again, we know that we have two books in our Bible that begin with the letter N. Both of those books are in the Old Testament. We have the book of Numbers, and then we have a little book over in the Minor Prophet section called the book of Nahum. Now the book of Numbers kind of deals with the wanderings of the nation of Israel from the time they left Egypt to the time they crossed Jordan and got over into the Promised Land. And really the number, the book of Numbers comes from the two numberings of of the nation of Israel, one in chapter 1, the other one way over in chapter 26 or 27, when God had the people numbered. I guess in our day we would say, uh, we would say God took a census of the number of people uh, that were in the nation of Israel. And we have in our Bible the book of Numbers. Also, we have the book of Nahum. And the book of Nahum basically deals with the destruction of the city of Nineveh, which was the capital city of the ancient empire of Assyria. So we have two books. We have Numbers and Nahum. Once again, when we start thinking about people in our Bible whose names begin with the letter N, one of the things, the first one that pops into my mind, is one of the first people that we meet in our Bible. His name is Noah. What about old Noah? He lived in a very wicked day, but he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a preacher of righteousness. He built the ark and preached and prophesied about the coming day of judgment. Noah, a great man in our Bible. And then right after Noah, there's another one just a couple of chapters over. His name was Nimrod. You ever read the story of old Nimrod? He is a wicked old cuss. Old Nimrod was. He, he's the one who founded and built the empire of Babel and it's there that God came down and confounded the languages of the people. There was old Nimrod. I want to say Nimrod. That's what my wife calls me all the time. Nimrod. But Nimrod. He was a wicked old boy in the Bible. And then there's another old boy in our Bible. His name begins with the letter N. And I like this boy. His name is Naboth. You ever read the story of Naboth over in the book of Kings? Naboth had a vineyard and it 
it was right beside of the vineyard of old wicked King Ahab. And Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard, but Naboth wasn't about to surrender it to him because his daddy gave it to him. You know, thank God for the heritage that's been handed down for us. And can I say this? Oh, Ahab wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard. Naboth looked back at him and said, it's not for sale. There's just some things that ain't for sale in this day and age in which we live. And I know people are doing anything and everything uh, for, a, for a price. But I'm telling you, friend, if your daddy gave it to you, you better hang on to it. Those things that have been handed down from one generation to the next generation are just not for sale. I'll tell you what, that Bible right there is not for sale. It was handed down from generation to generation. This pulpit right here is not for sale. Hey, that piano right there is not for sale. That choir is not for sale. This church, you know why? It was handed down to us from generation to generation. And friend, I just want to say to old Ahab, you can't have it. My daddy gave it to me. I like the story of Naboth. Naboth. What about you? And then we read about another old boy in our Old Testament whose name was Naaman. Remember Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5? He was, the, uh, he was a decorated, military, highly decorated veteran of Assyria, but the Bible said he was a leper. Remember the story? And oh, he went down to see the old preacher, independent fundamental preacher, Baptist preacher down there, Elijah, and uh, said, what do I need to do? And he told him to go dip in the Jordan River, and he got blowed up about it. But, buddy, when he finally did it, guess what? His skin was made whole. His leprosy was clean because he obeyed what the man of God said to do. I like the story of Naaman. I love the story of Nathan in the Bible. Nathan was the prophet that confronted King David about his sin with Bathsheba. Thank God for some old-fashioned Nathans who will still stand up and look folks in the eye and say, You've done wrong. Thou art the man, Nathan. Oh, oh, uh, uh, oh, whatever his name was. What was his name? Yeah, uh, Nathan. Uh, he went to King David and said, you're the man. And buddy pointed his finger in the face of the king, and old David got right with God. And then we have Nehemiah, the wall builder. And what about Nebuchadnezzar? I heard about this old preacher one time. He had a hard time pronouncing Nebuchadnezzar. So he said, Nebu had a razor. So however you want to say it, Nebuchadnezzar was a king of Babylon. By the way, I think old Nebuchadnezzar got saved. I look forward to meeting that rascal in heaven some of these days. Those are some great people in our Old Testament who name, whose name began with the letter N. In the New Testament, there's a few men in the New Testament whose name begins with the letter N. There's a boy by the name of Nicholas and then another one by the name of Nicanor. And both of those boys were two of the first deacons in the first church there chosen by the apostles. There's Nathaniel. Nathaniel, his friend Philip, brought him to Jesus. There's one old boy in the New Testament named Nymphus. He's mentioned over the book of Colossians, but without doubt, the most famous man in the New Testament whose name begins with the letter in has to be Nicodemus. I'm telling you, he come to Jesus by night. And old Nicodemus eventually got saved. I was reading his story, a little bit about his story. You know, he come to Jesus, and then a little bit later, he actually stood up for Jesus before the Sanhedrin court. And before the story is over, Calvary did something to him. In fact, after Jesus was died, old Nicodemus went and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus to give it a proper burial. You know what I think he was doing? I think he was making a public profession of his faith. Old Nicodemus, Nick at night, what a good man he turned out to be. Now, I can't leave the ladies out. So let me tell you this. There are seven ladies in our Bible whose name begins with the letter N. All, six of those ladies, all we have is just their name mentioned, so we know nothing about them. But I guess the most famous lady in our Bible whose name begins with the letter N would have to be <laughs> Naomi. You remember who, who old Naomi, Naomi was? She was the wife of Elimelech back in the book of Ruth. She was the wife of Elimelech. She was the mama of Malon and Chilion. And she was the mother-in-law of Ruth. She eventually went on to become the great-great-grandma of King David. And guess what? The 29th great-grandma of the Lord Jesus himself. What? 
What a good woman. After she got right, she should never went down to Moab. By the way, don't go down there. You know why? It's God's wash pot. That's where God keeps his dirty dishwater at, down there in Moab. Don't go down there. Stay out of Moab. She left Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread, the land of praise, and went down to old, the old dirty, filthy dishwater of Moab. Buddy, when she came out, God certainly did a work in her life. Then there are some famous places in our Bible that begin with the letter N. First of all, there's a mountain called Nebo, Mount Nebo. Now you say, what happened on Mount Nebo? That's where Moses, God took Moses up. God already told Moses, you can't go in the promised land, but I'm going to carry you up on the lofty heights of Mount Nebo. I'm going to let you look across. I'm going to let you see it, and then you're going to die right here. On Mount. And then God took him out somewhere and buried him because God knew if the nation of Israel got a hold of the body of Moses, they'd start worshiping him. That's right. That's the reason over the book of Jude we read that Satan and Michael disputed about the body of Moses. Remember that verse? You say, what was they fussing about? I think if the devil could have got it, got a hold of that body, he'd brought it to Israel, and they'd started worshiping the body of Moses. So God buried it in a private funeral somewhere by himself. God had a graveside service for old Moses on top of Mount Nebo. And then there's Nineveh. Boy, that's where Jonah was sent and finally went. And a great revival took place uh, in the land of Nineveh. And then over in the New Testament, two more names. We have a place called the city of Nain where a widow lady lived whose boy died and they were going out the gate of the city to bury him and Jesus walked by and as you and I know, nobody ever died or stayed dead in the presence of Jesus. And he raised that boy back up to life in the city of Nain. And finally, how could we mention end places in our Bible without talking about Nazareth? You know what Nazareth was? You know, basically the life of our Lord revolved around four cities, four towns. There was Bethlehem. That's where he was born. There was Capernaum. That's where his earthly headquarters was for his, uh, his, his earthly ministry. There was Jerusalem. That's where he was crucified. But you know, the most of the life of the Lord Jesus was spent in a place by the name of Nazareth. That's where he was brought up at, the Bible said. That's where he went back to the house of God that on that Sabbath day, and they got so mad at him that they took him out to the hill of the city, and they were going to throw him down the cliff and kill him. And Jesus snuck through the crowd and got away from the city of Nazareth. Now, I've got to tell you, I bless your heart. When I went looking for N words, most of the N words in the Bible all begin are either names of places or the names of people. But never fear... I have found enough to put together a sermon tonight. Now, i got to give you a word of caution before we even get into these words. These are some of the simplest words that you'll ever come across in your Bible. But i got to tell you, when you consider how these words were used in the Bible, they lead us to believe there are some great, great Bible words. Are you ready? Let's get started. The first one is the word... Never. Now, I know you're probably sitting there thinking, you know, what's the big deal about the word never? It's mentioned 83 times in our Bible. And just so we're all on the same page, let me define for you the word never. All right? Never. At no time. Not at all. No way. Not on your life. Forget it. Under no circumstances, in no case, not any time, any place, any person, by any means, will it ever happen. Never. Now, we use that word a lot in our just everyday language. For instance, maybe, maybe you went somewhere and you didn't like it too good and you said, I'll never go there again. Maybe you did something one time and you didn't like it too good and you say, I'll never do that again. Or maybe you say something like this, never in a million years. That's just a word that we use every day of our life. Never. Let me give you some good advice. Never say never. Because when you say never, most time you're going to do it again. <laughs> never say never. But what makes the word never so important is how the Lord Jesus used it. Because I'm telling you some of the greatest statements that Jesus ever made in our Bible are made around that word, never. 
Now, we know this. We know in John chapter 7 and verse number 46, the Bible said they sent these officers over to arrest Jesus. And when they got there, they, uh, Jesus asked them who they were looking for, and they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And here's what Jesus said, I am he. And when he said that, those, those soldiers just fell back down, and they went back and told, reported to those chief priests that sent them over there. They said, did you arrest him? They said, man, you don't get it. Never. Man spake like this man. I'm telling you, when Jesus spoke, he spoke with power and he spoke with authority. Never has anybody ever spoken like Jesus spoke. But let me show you some verses where he used the word never. Look at this one. Watch this. Jesus said unto them, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall, say it with me, never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, right there, Jesus said, I just want to tell you, for people who come to me, and by the way, we understand that when God created us uh, in the Garden of Eden, when he created Adam and Eve, he created them as perfect beings. But after they sinned, there was a vacuum on the inside. I'm telling you, after they sinned, God moved out of their, of, of their, their presence. God moved out, and it left a hole, and it left a vacuum, and Adam and Eve. And I will tell you something, every one of their descendants that's ever been born in this world has been born with an empty heart, an empty soul, and only Jesus can satisfy the emptiness, the longing of our heart. I'm telling you, you can run all over this world. You can, you can try this old dry, old dry and moldy and crusty bread. You can drink from these old broken cisterns of dirty, filthy water, but you'll never, ever, or if I could borrow the words of our Savior, you'll never, never find anything that'll feed your hunger or satisfy your thirst like Jesus can. He will, he will, you will never hunger, you'll never thirst when you come to Jesus. I've used this illustration before, but uh, suppose you were walking along the beach one day and this big old wave just comes up, one of those what they call a rogue wave, and, and it hits the shore, and when it hit the shore, it throws this big old fish up on the shore. And that old fish is just laying there wobbling. I mean, he's flopping around there. And, uh, and he's got to have some help. Uh, he's got to, he's got to, somebody's got to help him or he's going to lay there and die. Suppose you do this. You run and get a lawn chair and an umbrella and some grapeberry splash Kool-Aid. And you throw that old fish up in that chair underneath that umbrella and stick in his fin. You stick a Sports Illustrated magazine. Is that going to satisfy that fish? No, not on your life. Well, suppose you get a suitcase of money and you come up there and you throw that money, just spread it out all around that old fish. Is that money going to satisfy? No, not on your life. Hey, suppose you run out to the pier and catch a bunch of female fish and put bikinis on them and throw all them female fish with bikinis all around that old fish laying in that chair underneath that tent reading that Sports Illustrated magazine. Is that going to satisfy that fish? No, sir. Not on your, the only thing that's going to satisfy that fish is put him back in the water. Because he's got something in that water he can't find outside of that water. And just let me tell you this, you can run far and near, you can look high and wide, but you'll never find anything that'll satisfy you like Jesus will. You'll never hunger and you'll never thirst once you come to Jesus. The word never. I like this word. Look at this one. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall. What's that word? Never what? Oh, brother, it makes it sound like to me that once you're saved, you're saved. If I didn't have another verse in the Bible, but I got, I got John 3, 16. Uh, you know that God said, uh, those who, for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his own, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I got that verse. I, I've, got, I've got 1 John 2, 25. This is the promise he had promised us, even eternal life. I've got, all, I got that verse. I got Titus 1, 2 that says God can't lie. I got that verse that talks about eternal life. But I tell you, if this is the only verse that I had in my Bible, and this verse said what it said right there, Jesus said, I give unto them, those of my sheep, those who come to me, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Aren't you glad for that? There's a lot of things I got to worry about, but going to hell is not one of them. I deserve it. I get it. I ought to be there with my back broke. I ought to be frying like a piece of bacon in a hot black frying pan. I get it. That's what I deserve. But when I come to Jesus, Jesus said, don't worry about it. You're never going to perish. 
Isn't that good? You say, oh, preacher, now wait a minute now. you preaching that once saved, always saved stuff. I just want to tell you, I know so-and-so, and man, they got saved, and they lived for the Lord for five years, and then they turned their back on God. They're out smoking weed and drinking beer tonight. I'll tell you, they didn't have eternal life. They had five-year life. I'm telling you, when Jesus saves you, he gives you an eternal guarantee to your salvation, and it'll never, ever run out. Never hunger, never thirst, never perish. But there's another good verse. Watch this one. Jesus said unto her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he went on to say, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You say, preacher, hold on just a minute. We are going to die. Yeah, uh, physically, but not spiritually. I mean, we're going to live forever. Old D.L. Moody, when he was, he was in and out kind of right before he died, and, and his family was gathered around his son. I forgot, I just read this the other day, but his son was standing there at the bedside. And he started talking about his, he lost two grandchildren uh, before he died and broke his heart. And he said that one of them's name was Irene. I can't remember what the other grandson said. He said, I've seen Irene. I've seen uh, so-and-so. And, and, uh, and, he, and, and, and he come back to again, and he talked about uh, heaven is open. I see I I see the face of God. I, I'm going home. This is my coronation day. And he said this. He said, uh, one of these days when you read that old D.L. Moody is dead, but don't you believe a word of it? Because I'll be a lot more alive then than I've ever been before. You know why? We're never going to die, friend. Physically, I get it. I'm going to have to die some of these days, hopefully later than sooner. But uh, don't worry about it. I know where I'm going. Spiritually, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to never die. Let me give you this one. Oh, my goodness. You knew I'd get to this one. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he had said, say it with me, I will never. You see what makes it such a good Bible word? I mean, some of the great truths in our Bible, Jesus said, let me, let me use it like this. I'll leave that up, verse up there for just a minute. For he has said, I will never. Now let me go back at no time. Not at all. No way. Not on your life. Forget it. Under no conditions. In no case. Not any time, any place, any person, or by any means will I ever leave you. I will never forsake you. Good night. Never. Never. One final place. This is sad. And then will I profess unto them, there it is again. I never knew you. Oh, that religious crowd is going to be jerking out tithing receipts and church membership forms and baptismal certificates when they stand before God. And they're going to try to get all that before the Lord. And Jesus said, hey, depart from me. I never. It wasn't that the Lord knew them and then they got lost. There again is eternal security. Jesus said, I never knew you to start with. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The good Bible word of never. How many of y'all are with me? Never, never. Number two. Not only do we have the word never, but the second good Bible word is the word nothing. You say, preacher, what about nothing? Well, it's another one of those very common words. It actually appears 221 times in the Bible. The word nothing is actually made up of two words, no thing. Nothing, no thing. You know, I heard the other day that the best way to get paid for doing nothing is to change your last name to Kardashian. Nothing. That's the nearest nothing I've ever seen in my life. By the way, I, I, I ain't never seen it, so don't come to a preacher. You watch the Kardashians? I wouldn't waste my time watching something like that. Amen. But what makes this word so important, once again, is the way it's used in the Bible. The word nothing is used in our Bible oftentimes to, to, uh, pr to present great truths to us. Nothing. Let me show it to you. Luke 137, for with God, man, there it is. Nothing, no thing shall be impossible. You say, preacher, and I got a husband, he's lost as a ball in high ways. It's not impossible to God to save that old boy. Amen. There's no person too hard to save. There's no place too hard, for, no prayer too hard for God to answer. I'm telling you, the word, when it comes to God, there's nothing impossible. Here's another good use of that word, nothing. 
You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, well, with the shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for no thing. It's good for nothing. You know what? I don't mean this in a bad way, and I'm not talking about y'all, but we got a lot of good for nothing Christians in our day. Can I have an amen? There's salt that's lost its zest. It's zing. They become so enamored. They become so worldly that they have lost their ability to have an influence over their family. They're like old Lot when the angels came, told him, get out of here. And he went and told his sons-in-law. They laughed. They mocked at him. You know what happened? He was good for no thing. Nothing. Boy, I hope I never get good for nothing. Amen. Good for nothing. Look at this nothing. Here's a good nothing. Look at this. John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do no thing. You and I can't do anything without Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. We can't even breathe without Jesus. Man, we can't, we can't live without Jesus. Until lost or saved. We depend on Jesus, don't we? In Him, in Jesus, we live and move and have our very being. We're nothing without Him. Do nothing, nothing without Him. Look at this one, Philippians 4, verse 6. i got to hurry. Be careful for nothing, no thing. You know what that simply means? Put that for South Carolina. Don't you worry about nothing. Why in the world do we worry about everything for? Lay awake at night. Good night I got up last night and... Went to the bathroom, you know, get my age. I have to go to the bathroom five, six times at night. And I come back to bed, and then your mind clicks on, starts racing. First thing you know, you can't go back to sleep and just lay there and worry and think about this and that. And what's going to happen if this happens? What's going to happen if that happens? I went all the while, the Bible said this, be careful for nothing. Man, don't worry about it. Brother J.T. Lyons, don't worry about it. Why are you worried for it, he'd say. The master's going to take care of you. Be careful for nothing. And then here's a good one, and we'll wrap this one up on this. For we brought... Uh, Y'all help me now. Y'all are with me, right? All right, here we go. For we brought no thing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry... You ain't going to do it. You ain't going to do it. Who was it old Jack Benny used to say, you know, he was going to sow his money to his shroud... When he died, and he's going to carry it with him over there on the other side. I promise you, you open up his grave, that old money's corrupted, still laying there, sewed to a shroud over a skeleton. You can't carry it with you, friend. The only thing we can take with us to heaven is our family. Can't carry nothing. That's the word nothing. What a good, good Bible word. What about this one? Here's a good one. What about the word new? Once again... I'm telling you, when you just follow that little word new, it's used 131 times throughout the Bible. You know, that's the word we use a lot, just on a daily basis. You ladies get a new dress. Us men may get a new suit. By the way, did you see my new suit I had on two or three Sundays ago? Didn't even notice it, did you? Had a new suit on. Uh, you ladies have a new recipe. We go buy new cars or whatever, new lawnmowers. But this word new is often used in the Bible once again to introduce some great truths for us. What about this one right here? Look at this one, John 13, 34. Right before Jesus died in the upper room, just hours from Calvary, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Isn't that amazing? Right before he died, what was on his mind? Getting them boys to love one another. <laughs> a new commandment. Then look at this one. What about this one? 2 Corinthians 5. You know this one. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? He is a new creature. A new creature. Uh, and by the way, when you become a new creature, Psalms 40 verse 3, you get a new song. Ezekiel 36 verse 27, you get a new heart. Isaiah 43 verse 19, God said, I'm going to do a new thing. All of these. And finally, God said in Revelation 21 in verse number 5, uh, he said, he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things. Aren't you glad you're going to get a new body one of these days? And we're going to live in a new land forever and ever and ever. Good Bible word, the word new. And then we close with this one. Here's a good Bible word. What about this one here, the word neglect? 
You know, as you read through the Bible, you'll find out that word is used eight different times in the Bible, only once in the Old Testament, other seven times in the New Testament. And just so we're all on the same page, the word neglect means to become careless, indifferent, to ignore, to slight, or forget. And when you read in the New Testament, there are two things that we're told in the New Testament as God's people that we are never to neglect. Number one, look at this one. Hebrews 2 verse 3, we are not to neglect so great salvation. Now, by the way, he's not talking about unsaved people in that verse. He's talking about saved people. Because the writer of the book of Hebrews, Paul or whoever, said, how shall we escape if we Neglect. So he's including himself. We know Paul, if it was he who wrote the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, the one thing we know about it, man, they were saved. So he's actually talking about, hey, if you're a saved person, don't neglect your salvation. In other words, here's what happened. When we get saved, God works salvation in. But then after we get saved, we begin to work salvation out. Right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't neglect your salvation. Don't become careless with it or indifferent to it. Don't slight, don't ignore a so great a salvation. There's some things that ought to accompany salvation. I mean, we ought to, we ought to yeah, of course, we know we ought to get baptized. We ought to live right. We ought to daily read our Bible. We ought to witness to people. We ought to tithe. We ought to come to church. Don't neglect those things that come along with salvation. Can I have an amen? So don't neglect your salvation. And then last of all, Paul told Timothy this, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now, when you got saved, God gave you a spiritual gift. Some people are multi-gifted. Some people have several spiritual gifts, but everybody in here has at least one spiritual gift. And the Bible said, whatever you do, don't neglect that gift. Work on it. Hey, find out what it is and then work on it. I didn't know this when God saved me. But when God saved me, God gave me the gift the spiritual gift of pastoring or teaching the Word of God. I didn't know that back then. So what I've had to do on through the year, and I'm no, I'm no case where I ought to be with it, but I am, I, I've, I've, worked, I've worked on it. I used to get tapes of preacher, one of my favorite preachers. Don't be mad at me right here, and I know uh, years later he probably went in different directions, and he's in heaven now. Well, the Lord will straighten all that out in the judgment seat. But one of the preachers, when I first got saved, I used to listen to all the time, don't be mad at me, Jack Van Impey. Now, I know, I know things happened there at the end. I get all that. But I used to order tapes, send that old, I sent him money. I ordered him tapes because all he was about was Bible prophecy. And I was fascinated. And I used to hear Jack Van Impey preach. Then I heard people like Mays Jackson. He'd come to Friendly Chapel. And when he went there, uh, will President Reagan die in office? Beloved, get your pencil and write down five reasons why President Reagan will die in office. I used to go hear, will, uh, will man ever reach the moon? I, and I mean, just stuff like that. I used to hear Mays Jackson preach. And what I did when I heard all that stuff, man, I, I, I gleaned from it. I gathered. I saw how they made outlines, and, and I listened to them preach, and I sat under preachers. I went to revival meetings, and I bought books, and, I, and I, God, God gave it to me. But boy, have I had to work on it, and I'm still a work in progress. Y'all pray for me, but I don't want to neglect that gift. I don't want to just throw it aside. Use it or lose it. Yeah, that's why some of you boys that's been called to preach, man, get you a rest home somewhere. Get on a church bus. Man, God has given you a spiritual gift. Don't just, he didn't give it to you just to sit on a church pew. He gave it to you to use, and you ought to develop it and work on it and make it the best gift, use it the best way that you possibly can. Don't neglect to give. So let's go over. Here they are. Word number one is number two. Number three. Number four. Y'all read them off the screen, I know. <laughs> Great words of our Bible. That began with the letter N. To be honest with you, there ain't a whole lot of words in our Bible that begin with the letter N. I kind of struggle with that one, but those are some good words. Let's pray. Father, I'm so glad.